and Andrew Witte and is based in Berlin and Boston. Certain measures draws from research in architecture, technology, strategy and history in experimental modes of design. There we have on one side a very major, very major or major industrial clients, uh, governments and also cultural institutes. Recently, their work was shown in Centre Pompidou in Paris, House der Culturen der Welt in the framework of forecast, and Futurium in Berlin and the Angewandte in the Innovation Lab in Vienna. Tobias Nolte of Certain Measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to present um, the project that we have developed in the course of um, uh, Housing the Human called um, Home is Where the Droids Are. And um, I want to basically go a step back to show sort of like er very early um, like interest of ours um, that sort of like funneled ultimately into this project. Um, actually, there is this, um, this really fantastic book by Ed Roche, um, 34 Parking Lots in Los Angeles. Um, where he took a plane, uh, a helicopter on, an, on a Sunday in um, LA and he photographed empty uh, parking lots of, um, of strip malls. And so what he was interested in was actually not um, the spatial provision of each of the parking lots, but he was interested in the, um, in the size of the oil stains, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the size of the oil stain is sort of like an indicator of how much do you actually use a particular space. So there is a, in, this Im in these images, there is a very strong discrepancy between whatever we spatially provision and whatever sort of like is the, the actual time of usage. And we were very much interested in, in sort of like this discrepancy, not on an urban scale, but on, an, on a domestic scale. Um, and so we basically do the same thing, particularly in very small um, floor plans that we provision actually space within our domestic space that we use just very rarely, right? So the same discrepancy um, that Ed Roche is describing um, happens here as well. And it becomes actually, you know, increasingly more so because, you know, whatever we, whatever we sort of like provision aesthetic spaces in, the, in, sort of in our apartments becomes increasingly more diversified into service on demand systems, um, um, whether or not it's like, you know, or like you know, food delivery or, you know, that kinds of stuff. So um, um, what we sort of like then became interested is it's like, let's develop floor plans that are very much sort of like, um, it's basically like a time sequence. It's not, it's not a floor, it's not a house where you have separate rooms, but it's a house where you have always the same room, but it, it's programmed always differently, right? So we came up with this like um, super, super tiny floor plan, um, 14 square meters, and we <coughs> wanted to basically create a floor plan that is always, always <coughs> the room that you need in that very moment. Um, but the experience was supposed to be better than any other um, tiny house. But you know, not basically making a super tiny bathroom and a super tiny kitchen, but sort of like, um, it is always the space that you need. So we started with like a morning coffee, um, you know, you open up the, the floor and it's like the shower. So in the moment where you want to take a shower, it is the shower and it's an an, a really amazing shower experience. Um, it's your walk-in closet. You basically reprogram it. It's your walk-in closet as you pull out the, the, um, the, um, your little uh, cupboard. You know, it becomes the kitchen um, for, a, for breakfast. Um, it becomes sort of like your hangout um, during, um, you know, t during the day, um, and eventually becomes a kitchen again for dinner, and then it, you know, it becomes sort of like a jacuzzi and your wellness for, you know, in the evening hour, right? So, like, you have, like, um, the same room, but it's programmed differently um, over the course of the day, and then, you know, ultimately, you know, you pull the curtain closed, you climb up there, and then you lie in your super, like, in a small bed, but you have an, an Oculus looking into the sky, right? So it's like, it's an amazing sort of like um, uh, sleep experience. So, and then we thought, what if we were to um, not measure, so like not an arithmetic of, of domestic spaces as a sum of spaces, but as a sum of experience. So it might be like in terms of square footage, it might be a very small space, but you know, if you add all the experience, it becomes this like really um, fantastic space. So like it, it's like the, the, the arithmetic is sum of experience rather than sum of spaces. So we, you know, d developed it further. You know, we, we 
we um, so like set out uh, three strategies. The one was that we called universal materialism. So we thought, what would be the um, what would be the material that could, like that you would use in your space? The second strategy was um, exuberance. So we thought like to in increase this ex experience, we would have to be like you know exuberant and like yeah. And then the third one was we we said like no object in the op in the place can have only one function. It n always needed to be multiple functions. We called it so bipolar furniture. And then we said like okay like a lamp is a lamp on the one side and it's a disco ball on the other side, right? So that none you know nothing in that space only has one one function. Or you know it's like a stair and a bookshelf um, that kind of stuff. And then. Um, we did a lot of like um, research on textiles, um, where we said um, also like textile is sort of like something that has like multiple functions, and we thought of it as sort of like um, the first one, so like anti-noise, anti-social, um, uh, anti-wet, anti-anti-wet. It's hard to read. Um, and then the last one is like anti-boring, right? But like like the, even the, the surfaces have like play multiple roles in that um, in that space, and then we rendered it sort of like as a so like a as a what we called like the Berlin buoy, so like this like floating um, um, floor plan, 11, 14 square meter, but an amazing experience. Um, so you know, thinking about space as a as a sum of experience, we then took it actually to the to the to the next level. I'm thinking about, you know, if it's only, um, if it's sort of like mechanical transformation, what would be the next uh, next step? And then we thought, like, what if what if we had one space that was sort of like just what, like basically packed with everything we had, but it's um, essentially droids, and the droids would come to us um, de depending on when we need them, when we need them, right? So imagine you have a blank space, and um, the furniture sort of like comes to you as you as you wish, right? So like your bed comes to you when you need it. Um, you know the the breakfast flies in by a drone. Um, eventually, you know your bathroom comes to you, uh, and you sort of like you always have this like empty space that is reprogrammed um, according to your to your needs. Um, and it's you know basically what was the mechanical transformation or like more mechanical transformation in the, in the beginning becomes this um, really independent uh, uh, drones, land drones that come to you um, as you wish. Um, and then in the evening, yeah, you get ready for bed. Um, and then eventually in the evening, you get of course like a you know a late night snack. And then all your um, so like all your all your droid or like all your drones so like creep back into your house um, very silently, uh, yeah. So that was that was sort of like the thought that we had. Like, what if we what if we sort of like live with we live with um, uh, drones, right? And um, and you know the the technical aspect of it. Uh, was one that we uh, worked a lot with, um, so like literally like designing furniture that you can that you can that basically can can move and can come to you um, is a little bit of context aware. So like you know it obviously not on the like Roomba scale or whatever, but like you know like we we managed to build so like prototype uh, platforms for um, furniture, but then the the much more um, sort of complicated. Um, thing was that you know the thought that we don't when you think about it we don't really have a lot of domestic robots right now right I mean we have we have despite all predictions Bill Gates wrote this article ten years ago uh, a robot in every home but you know really not like a lot it didn't didn't happen a lot right like the Roomba is basically what it is so speculating around um, what is it that we actually what would it take for us to accept um, um, robots or like domestic robots uh, in our house we thought so, so we thought of actually sort of like domestication right like what made the wolf become sort of like the the mops yeah so there's something happened that we eventually accepted the the dog in our domestic space and it's probably not around um, um, kind of like function or utility Right, because we saw the the, the presentation, of, um, your presentation with the Spot Mini. Right, like it's a it's a weird vision of domestic robots because you take, 
like sort of like labor saving device from sort of like an industrial context. And then you say like, yeah, let's go take it into the apartment and you know do the dishes, right? It's like it's like a labor saving device that, but is very much connotated, um, and their ecosystem is very much the ecosystem of industry. And we sort of like speculated on, you know, beyond utility, you know, companionship, um, um, entertainment, and these kinds of values that you know we look in we look into when we look at our cat, right? The cat doesn't have any utility; it's annoying most of the time. So we then so like designed these furniture um, that would move um, and. To a, to a certain extent be context aware, but give them really sort of like character that, you know, it also like goes back to these like bipolar um, um, qualities. Um, so like it's a conductor stand, but a shelf rack and give them sort of like character. Um, it's, a, it's a bookshelf, but also a stair um, that's covered in fur. Um, so we're trying to come up with these like domestic robots that are, provide much more sort of like companionship um, rather than um, just utility. So, yeah. And then overly domesticate them, or like, like basically like using, you know, all the so like um, wallpapers we would know from the 60s or 70s. It was like, you know, fur, the sausage of the future, the, the like fur interior of this magazine rack, um, and then presented it actually at Radial System with these um, with like a um, video that we'll show uh, right after. So like two projections in this um, in like a rather spacious uh, place, and then in the middle we would have this like domestic scene where these do, where these like um, bots would um, uh, drive around. And unfortunately, this video is a little too long to actually um, show it until the very um, end. There is actually a little bit of sound. Can you turn on the sound? No? Yeah, I do something, yeah. So maybe I do the sound, no. Um, so imagine, you know, imagine, you know, there is like a, this like very sort of like domestic, comfortable scene. There is like a, a chicken soup boiling in the back. Um, there's like a, a clock ticking, right? It's like very, so like a Saturday afternoon. Um, there's like some radio from somewhere that you don't really know where it's from. And then you, we, we wanted to create this like domestic scene where you like it's like the most normal thing to do. She's she's actually cleaning. It's not the Roomba. Um, you know, as she sort of like um, cleans the shelf, the shelf starts to purr. Um, She's reading the she's reading the newspaper, but the the sort of like a magazine rack is is sort of like annoyed and wants to have attention, so it starts spinning and plays. And so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, mm. I'm looking into the spotlights and uh, looking for questions. Yeah, Lisbeth. Uh. Okay, I, I was wondering, as so uh, I heard it in the introduction, uh, your, your research is hypothesis driven, uh, um, and uh, or design is hypothesis driven. Um, and I wondered in the presentation, uh, I like the jumps you make from one design step into another, but I try to understand a bit how you drive these design decisions. So how do you make a step 
from saying, okay, uh, we go from one object to an object with two functions. How does that happen? Is that improvisation or uh, how's it how does that work? Yeah. Oh, like now really like on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Um, I think, no, I mean like we, we if we, we basically the start around, um, and really that was sort of like the, the stage we set, is to say like how can we do, how can we drastically minimize space and drastically uh, expand experience? Mm -hmm. um, and then it was literally like, you know, thinking about design strategies. And um, what we thought is kind of like, you know, a, an object that only has one, um, one um, reason or like for existence uh, is simply like we don't have space for that. And then, um, and then we sort of like set that as a strategy. So like it, it, it always has to be multiple uses. Yeah. So it's more pragmatic. Right? It's very pragmatic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Oops. Um, hey, uh, I was very. Uh, when you have been introducing your very tiny space. Uh, I was uh, uh, thought was popping up into my mind that is a very rigid space that is mm -mm yeah. very resilient to change or to whatever. And then you came up with that perfect solution of <laughs> the drones of the movable furniture that uh, that could basically create every possible space in that very tiny spatial setup. So, but then I was like a bit like okay, and I was really nervous. How would that get to an end? What with, with what ideas we are coming up with, and then I see some fur uh, guys <laughs> coming up, and then was I, I was thinking, oh man, but where do they go out of my tiny space when when I need the tiny space for my bed? Where's the fur staircase thing going? That is, uh, it was so pragmatical. All that I really love this uh, evaluation of of ideas, and then I thought, what are they doing with the missing objects when this space is occupied by just one experience. Yeah. So I would really love to know. No, 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 but like basically we, we set out two things, right? And you know, we, we ag again, you know, we, uh, this project is called, uh, Housing the Human is called uh, prototyping the, f uh, the future. Um, and I think like what we try to do in this, in our prototype is to set two layers in a way to the problem. The one is sort of like the, the problem of spatial provisioning and you know, we currently, you know, we basically just, like basically it's like one floor plan, but you know, how does that work with multiple floor plans is something to, to and multiple floor plan and peak demand. Because, you know, oftentimes what we, the, the problem that we have is with these kind of like, sh um, like sharing would be that oftentimes people want to do the same thing at the same time. Um, so if the spatial provisioning is something that is like now the next step for us, um, actually exploring uh, housing typologies uh, with uh, domestic robots, but not in a single house, in a single unit, but in with 200 units, for example. And the second one is more of an investigation around um, domestication of uh, technology in the broader sense. So like, you know, what would it take, or like, what would be speculations? And you know, we are not saying like, this is how, this is how the world will be, but like, what is sort of like the alleyways for design um, for us to accept um, robots in our domestic space? Yeah. There are in fact as a two furry, projects. As also. a furry thing, Maybe and it, it, it blended yeah. two projects into another, mm -hmm. uh, which, which, was, which, was an, which I haven't been able to follow as a solution in this mm -hmm. sense. So why are they coming up with this cool droids flying around and bringing me in? And I was really expecting a 3D rendering of cool drones that are placing yeah. chairs, whatever. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a bit techy, techy mm -hmm. big thing. So, But then the fur thing was uh, a bit uh, um die ecke rum, so I, I, oh yeah. I, wasn't, uh -huh. I wasn't understanding the w this part of the solution in this point, so that was, that's why sure. I wanted to just uh, uh, interview you on this a bit. So yeah, I think Thank the mix-up is a bit that it's like two projects, and you, you showed a way of working and thinking and reflecting, and then jumped immediately to the housing, uh, the human prototype. Yeah, but for us, for me, it was also clear, but I understand now the mix-up there. But it's the same attitude, you could say. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Tobias. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. In the meantime, uh, the drones yes. brought with also some. Yeah, no, I was I was lost too. Yeah. Uh, nah. I love the, the the furry drones though. Uh, <laughs> I would love to cuddle one <laughs> uh, in a consensual way. Uh, <laughs> uh, they they reminded me of a catwalk, and that reminded me of rides at Fred. Uh, I'm a model, you know what I mean. <laughs> and then you thought you were cocky too, so I found it funny. <laughs> so yeah, the, the creepy drones who look at you when you sleep. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> funny stuff. <laughs> uh, the the little thinking space. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you didn't don't need space to think, except for your own space in your mind. And that's yeah the re the representation of the time module. Uh, yeah, that's as far as I got. <laughs> I need drones to work for me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>